Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Climate Politics is Local. Um, I'm Penny Abby Wardina, New York City's Commissioner for International Affairs, um, and it is an honor to chair this session with this incredible panel. I want to quickly <clears throat> introduce them to you. We have Ayaka Melithafa, a youth activist from the African Climate Alliance um, from Cape Town, South Africa. We have Cohen Van Ustrom, founder and CEGO of Edge Technologies and OVG Real Estate. Um, Mr. Fahad Al Rashid, the president of the Royal Commission for Riyadh City, the new mayor, so congratulations. Um, and His Holiness, His All Holiness, Patriarch Bartholomew, Archbishop of Constant Constantinople, New Rome, and the Ecumenical Patriarch moderate, Moderated. So I actually just came from the session on global risk, and guess what um, the top risk for uh, the next decade is? It's climate. So this is a very, very relevant topic. Um, it's an honor for me to join these panelists because in New York City, um, and as an American, we've really had to take a leadership role to reflect the realities that's happening in our communities around climate change. Um, New York City um, experienced Superstorm Sandy a couple of years ago. The amount of damage and the lives lost really brought home climate change to New Yorkers. Um, in the last couple of years, Mayor de Blasio has uh, launched our Green New Deal. Um, which I want to share a couple of the highlights. Um, we require all large buildings to conduct retrofits to lower their emissions, a global first. We're banning construction of all glass facade buildings. <gasps> We're converting city government operations to Canadian hydropower. We're mandating organics recycling and, end it, and ending unnecessary city purchases of single-use plastic food. So this has been a really exciting time for us. Um, New York City, and I have the opportunity to co-chair the Global Futures Council, um, which has been um, really taking on the lead and partnering um, with the city of Helsinki around lowering carbon emissions. Um, they are doing a pretty extreme, ex excellent job by 2035. They are going to reduce their carbon emissions and really focus um, on getting rid of their coal plants, which is just leadership in this space. Um, one of the other areas that New York City is doing is tracking what we're doing to the Sustainable Development Goals. And we are working with the UN and other cities around voluntary local reviews to showcase how we're localizing the SDGs and really focusing on climate change and climate action. Um, and so this panel is really about understanding you have national governments that are abdicating their responsibility on issues like climate, but we most represent from our religious leaders, to our CEOs, to our community activists, to our mayor, um, we best represent our community. So how do we um, accelerate impact and change in our community? And so it is my pleasure to hand it over to Ayaka first. She um, is representing activism in Cape Town, South Africa. I happened to be in Cape Town during the drought, and it was really extraordinary the amount of uh, behavior change that they were encouraging. When you went to a restaurant and washed your hands, the water doesn't flow, it sprays. Um, they encourage you not to flush if you have just urinated. Um, and these are some of the things that I think behavior change-wise you can really um, take to your own life. And so Ayaka, I want to hear a little bit about what you've been experiencing in your community and the leadership you've been showing um, in representing climate action with your community. Um, I won't lie in that aspect. Thank you for giving me this, this platform. Um, it's been really hard to advocate for climate change at a local level with people that are like me, um, vulnerable people, people of colour, people that have no like it means into information and what's going on in the current world because they believe that climate change are first world problems, not understanding that climate change will affect the vulnerable first. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, we have to highlight the fact that we can't really blame them for thinking that way. Um, in South Africa right now, we're facing a lot of socioeconomic problems and they're all hitting us at once. For example, xenophobia, um, gender-based violence, gangsterism and so on. So it's very hard for me to go up to a person and talk to them about climate change. To me, they almost like shut me down and tell me how do you expect me to take um, in consideration climate change when I'm afraid if my child is going to come back home today. Mm. Um, we are facing a lot of problems, so that's why I always try to engage in conversations with people around me and make them aware that climate change is directly um, interlinked with other socioeconomic problems. You can't really separate it for other, um, from socioeconomic problems. And in order for us to actually tackle the socioeconomic problems, we have to address climate change and also take it into consideration. Absolutely. Excellent. And that's a good transition to His All Holiness. Um, 
you represent an incredibly large community and your, your power within that community. How are you using your influence to mobilize civic action around climate, around climate crisis and really showing the, the leadership um, of, your, um, of your church? Thank you, moderator. <clears throat> I was told to prepare a short introduction, if you allow me Absolutely. to read it. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. For over 30 years now, the Ecumenical Patriarchate has pa pioneered global and local awareness on climate change. This is not a matter of personal pride for the Orthodox priority. As a result, we have concentrated our efforts in mobilizing all faithful and people of goodwill, as well as all people of authority in all segments of society, to recognize and remember that our external actions are a reflection of our innermost attitudes. By the same token, what we witness in our world is an extension of what we want in our heart. Mm. So, the question we would like to address to all this, after, this afternoon is, what do we really want in our heart and for our world. Mm. After all, we know what needs to be done, <coughs> and we know how it must be done. We have heard the facts. We have been made aware of the science. We surely envisage the future. Unlike previous generations, we have no excuse. We cannot claim that we didn't know. Nevertheless, Despite the information at our disposal, it is becoming abundantly clear that so little is unfortunately being done. This is because the crisis that we face has less to do with nature or the environment and more to do with the way we perceive and treat the world. We are abusing the earth in an irresponsible and godless manner, precisely because we look at it in this way. Unless we radically change the way we see the world, unless we voluntarily transform our pattern of consumption, then we will continue dealing with symptoms rather than with their causes. What we propose to you, dear friends, is that there is an enormous gap and an immense distance between the head, the heart, and the hands. It is a long and difficult journey from the head to the heart. And it is an even longer and rigorous journey from the heart to the hands, to action. We are called to bridge that gap, to close that distance. It is, of course, comforting and promising to witness so many diverse categories of people. Many of them are here among us today in, in, in Davos, increasingly accepting the challenge and embracing the urgency of climate change. The fact that we are here today as concerned citizens and leaders makes us optimistic. However, we can no longer transfer the responsibility to others. We cannot afford to shift the blame elsewhere. There is no excuse for any delay. We have experimented with our world's sustainability and exhausted our planet's resources. We have exploited the Earth and prematurely led species to extinction. What is worse, we have exposed the most vulnerable among us to the consequences of our reckless consumption of energy. In order to restore the balance of our planet, we need a spiritual worldview, which promotes humility, respect, and solidarity. We must become conscious of the impact of our actions on creation and other people. We must direct our focus away from what we want to what is our duty and to what the planet needs. Otherwise, we are just entertaining 
convenient conversations and idle talk. Distinguished guests and friends, we believe that our planet unites us in a very unique way. The Earth transforms the global into the profoundly local. Think about this. Each one of us is different with regard to background and status, position and prestige, ideology and belief. Everyone in this room may hold a different conviction or opinion about the origin and destiny of our world. All of us may disagree on social policy or political action. However, we all agree on the need to protect our world and its natural resources, uh, which are neither infinite nor debatable for future generations. So the Earth makes everything local <coughs> and personal. We are all in this together. We are all in the same boat. Hmm. There is no place for indifference, and there is no time for indecision. Many of our world's global and political leaders are among us here in Davos. We urge them to be more ambitious in their legislation and more tenacious in their action. We ask them to take the proper measures with clarity and commitment. We encourage them to pay attention to the momentum on the grassroots level and the swelling protests around the world, not only by those suffering from the impact of climate change, but also by the youth imploring for their future and calling for solidarity of generations. Their world, our world, is not negotiable. The world is waiting, the world is watching. We are responsible for our inadequate and inconsistent action. We are accountable for our role in the plight of refugees and our contribution to natural calamities. By some mysterious connection that we do not always understand and sometimes choose to ignore, the Earth reminds us of our vocation to protect our planet and its natural resources, of our obligation to preserve and sustain these for our neighbors and for future generations. We will be judged by the urgency with which we respond to the ecological crisis of our age. The Earth has the resilience to heal but only if we allow it to remain whole. Dear friends, this is the conclusion. We pray that the results of this panel and conversation will provide means to explore ways for bridging the untenable and unacceptable gap between theory and practice in our collective vocation and moral obligation to respond to climate change with a sense of priority, gravity, and sincerity. May God bless your noble efforts to care for his creation, and thank you for your attention. If I am allowed to add something uh, out of my own experience, yes. this is what my church is doing uh, for almost 30 years already. Uh, we tried to convoke several environmental symposia, mm. nine symposia, interfaith, international, and interdisciplinary mm. in, in the Aegean Sea, uh, Baltic Sea, uh, Adriatic Sea, on the Danube River, Amazon, Greenland, uh, Mississippi, and so on. And uh, we invited, as I said, people from all segments of the society and we tried to say to them <coughs> honestly and with humility uh, that we have to uh, see the env environmental problem not simply as an economic or technological problem, but as a moral and theological problem. 
that is to say we have to see and underline the spiritual dimension <coughs> of the creation. If we believe in God and we say that we love God, we have to love and protect his creation. Mm. And that is why through these symposia mm. and uh, smaller uh, seminars we organized in Istanbul and elsewhere, we tried to uh, sensitize people, especially young people, uh, to more respect, love and protect mm. the natural environment. Uh, last June, we organized a summit in Istanbul with a few participants, but top participants from many universities and countries. Uh, and the theme was how to introduce uh, uh, environment studies into the universities and especially the theological schools theological seminars so that the young generation of yeah. religious uh, leaders and theologians are aware mm. and, uh, uh, and then they can integrate it into their sermons and, and that's a beautiful transmit way to, get to, the to the others Absolutely. so that we can uh, hope that the coming generation will be more sensitive in environmental Well, having affairs. Ayaka and Greta and all the other youth here, we're seeing that that's actually, that message is getting across and they are angry and activated. And I want to transition to Fahad. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, as I introduced this um, panel, um, cities now are really where it's at. At the end of the day, we are representing <coughs> our communities um, better than any other level of government because we're seeing the impact of what's happening. Um, you're the new mayor. Um, there's been some ex exciting work happening in Riyadh around clean infrastructure. It would be wonderful if you can share with us like how decision makers are learning from successful examples and what, uh, what other areas that um, Riyadh and you're leading um, around climate action. I want to be part of the youth, so... If you, <laughs> you are a young global leader, so there you go. <laughs> uh, well, um, look, I was uh, in New York uh, during Hurricane Sandy, and I saw the, the impact of climate change on cities, and I also recognize that cities are partially or majorly uh, the source of it. Seventy yeah. percent of global emissions come out of cities, so an urban uh, environment. So we have a major responsibility to words uh, addressing climate change. Mm. I'm very proud that Saudi Arabia, my country, uh, has been very effective at addressing its own uh, emissions and, and uh, reducing its own emissions. Uh, the EIA uh, ranked it the fourth among G20 countries mm. last year in addressing climate change and reducing emissions. So I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud uh, of what the city of Riyadh has been doing in a clean infrastructure. I want to take credit for it, but I've been appointed just two months ago, so I <laughs> can't take full credit for it. I will try. You're um, going to take it to its next level, though, so... <laughs> Uh, for example, we're building the largest metro uh, project in the world, public transport. This is the first public transport project uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, it is a $27 billion project that will come online this year. And so this project is supposed to uh, decrease car use by 20%, which is a significant um, um, decrease, given that it is currently a public transport is just 1% of the total transport uh, uh, provision in Saudi Arabia. So it is a big difference. It's a 20 time uh, multiplier, but it also means that people actually have to use it. So it's nice to build the big infrastructure, but how do we increase awareness and make sure that we have the right ecosystem for people to actually use it? So it means we price the tickets well and we give people incentives both through uh, proximity and last mile solutions for transport to allow them to use it uh, well. But it's also about community participation. So lots of, we have another project called um, um, a, a waste, z zero waste by 2030. So we wanna get 81% of all of the municipal waste to be processed and, uh, and uh, recycled. But we can't do it alone as government. We have to engage the, the citizens of Saudi Arabia, and especially in the city of Riyadh, in doing that. And we've tried this through two community programs where participation in the first month was 65%. Mm. So it is really about awareness. Mm -hmm. I think people are ready, mm -hmm. but they need leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, cities need to lead uh, in this area, and I believe that uh, the city of Riyadh has many examples of that. Absolutely, and we'll come back because I want to talk about the Urban 20 as well. Sure. Um, Cohen, we're talking about every, every stakeholder that is a key to this movement. Um, 
you have been doing extraordinary work with your company around turning climate risk into a competitive advantage. Can you tell us more specifically about that work, but also how you're encouraging other, um, other companies to join you in this? So I started uh, over 10 years ago. I randomly met Al Gore and got impressed by his story. Uh, he basically told a, a group of Dutch people that if the dikes break in, in the Netherlands and everything would be underwater, would that now be a political issue or would that be something where everybody would work together? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that the Dutch, um, in our tradition of building dikes, sort of see this as the same uh, thing that is happening, <coughs> especially from the business community. We've seen a lot of companies working together and, and move forward. Um, we see for the first time that now the government is also sort of catching up and there's legislation now that you're not allowed to rent out an office as of 2021, so basically mm. next year, mm -hmm. if it doesn't have an energy label C, mm. which is 52% <coughs> of the buildings, the office buildings in the Netherlands currently don't have that. Mm. And there's a rush at the moment to get it done. Mm. And for the first time now, we see them see a move. And the only way that it could happen is because um, our prime minister decided that he wanted to have a green deal. And he yeah. invited a couple of uh, uh, business people uh, together with uh, people from government, different cities. Uh, and of course, the Netherlands basically is one big city. Yeah? We're a relatively small country. And people sat together. And what was so important is that our prime minister said, this is where we need to go. And this is carbon neutral in 2050. It's the Paris Agreement. And to get there, I need your help. Tell me what to do. And um, within the businesses, there were people who were more aggressive. And, and I said, hey, energy label C is not enough. It should be B. And let's take the housing market as well. Prime Minister was saying, well, the housing market, that those people vote. <laughs> and so <laughs> let's be careful. But it happened. For me as a company, it means that there are thousands of buildings mm. in an area where, where people know my company that need to be retrofitted, where people are looking for, hey, who has the best competitive offer to do what legislation is giving? <coughs> and it's a total um, win for all those companies that are on the forefront of innovation and, and moving. <coughs> um, we've been very successful to, to export that. We see on a European level that the real estate industry is really waking up mm. and, and starting to move. The only problem that I, that I currently see that with all these initiatives, and even with the Dutch going to energy label C, it's too little and too late. Mm -hmm. We're way too slow. If we really are serious about Paris, mm -hmm. then we have to do a lot more than we're currently doing. And for me as a company, I, you know, I might be on stage in Davos and, and, uh, and make a nice, nice profit. And at the same time, I'm not doing enough to solve the, prob uh, to pro the problem. And therefore, somehow we have to find a way to really scale this and accelerate mm -hmm. in order to go faster. Absolutely. Well, you know, what you're um, talking about at the end of the day is action in communities. Um, and so, Ayaka, one of the things that I wanted to uh, talk to you about, um, having that example from, uh, from uh, Cape Town earlier, you know, one of the areas in New York City, we have eight and a half million people, is um, behavior change, right? And we partnered with Swell, um, the water bottle company, to give all high school students um, a reusable bottle, right? We need to shift away from, um, from plastic use, single plastic use. Um, and I'm curious how you think your city and cities around the world, because you're part of this alliance, um, what more can we do? Um, how can we be held more accountable? What would you like to see from um, your local government? Um, I feel like I have to address this at a more um, a high level, I believe. Um, I feel like the one of the reasons why we haven't actually been reaching the SDGs um, or the process has been so slow is because um, big companies or CEOs in those companies um, are very um, are undermining democracy and they're using tax havens to actually not pay taxes to countries or continents that need the development. They can use that money to actually um, eliminate um, joblessness, eliminate um, inequality and so on and so forth. So I feel like we really have to address that aspect. We really have to keep um, countries and even um, global aspects accountable for the fact that they're not actually doing enough. We can't expect um, countries that are not developed, countries that are very struggling to actually be implementing big change because already we are struggling. Even before climate change came here, mm. um, came to our countries and has been hitting us hard, we've been struggling as those countries. And that's why we really have to keep um, big developed countries, um, predominantly the global north, accountable for what they are not doing and their duties as um, people that already um, 
people that are already developed in order for us to them to pull us up and also to get us developed but developed in a sustainable way so i really feel like there's a lot that we have to do as people in cities to come together as a collective and put the right amount um convince our governments mm. um in the correct way for them to act accordingly and to also make sure that all of these policies um, are not only talked in theory but are also implemented so that we can make sure that we move on from this point in a sustainable way that's right and you know what what we've been seeing around um around issues like climate but also migration are cities coming together in collectives to be able to sort of flex our collective power, right? That's with the sustainable development goals specifically, this voluntary local review. But now with the Urban 20, which a couple of years ago was started um, by the mayor of Paris in Buenos Aires. And this was really um, an opportunity to ensure that at the G20, that the issues of urban areas were being represented. Um, Riyadh is going to be host um, to the next Urban 20. And I'd love for you to share some of the priorities related to climate specifically that you're looking um, to hold us and the G20 accountable to. Well, we're very proud to be hosting the, the Urban 20 in, in October, and I hope to see many of you there uh, in Riyadh. But uh, I, I look, ultimately, the Urban 20 is a forum for us all. The G20 is an 80% 80 uh, contributor to world economy and uh, similarly in that way to emissions. And therefore, our cities need to be at the forefront of addressing that. And the Urban 20 is a perfect um, uh, a perfect uh, um, uh, uh, place to address this by a sharing experiences, ideas for how to address climate change, but also bringing consensus and making commitments. That's and right. that's what we intend to on, uh, on, on doing in uh, the Urban 20 in Riyadh. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. Um, His All Holiness, um, you spoke um, beautifully earlier about this. Um, the way that you're you're essentially ensuring that your um, your congregation is learning at all different levels at ages um, about climate change. I'm curious, are you sharing specific actions um, that they are that they should be taking the types of coalitions and campaigns um, that would have the most impact? You know, you're teaching them about the importance of climate change, but what yes. are you asking them to then do about it? Of course, we don't dispose <coughs> material means to make many things, but only uh, on a spiritual level. Mm. First of all, we started to work together with His Holiness the Pope, Pope Francis, who is very sensitive in these uh, uh, problems in this area. And uh, he is very close to the poor people around the globe, very close to the refugees. In fact, we have visited together uh, some four years ago uh, a refugee camp in, in, on the island of Lesbos in Greece, together with the Archbishop of Athens. Uh, we spent one whole day with the refugees. We had lunch with them and as you may know uh, the pope uh, leaving uh, lesbos uh, he brought with himself uh, 12 muslim families refugees uh, who are uh, located uh, in rome under the protection of, of the vatican of the catholic church we have initiated another kind of uh, collaboration uh, with His Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury mm. uh, against uh, modern slavery and human trafficking. I invited His Grace the Archbishop of Canterbury to Istanbul and we held together uh, a, a conference on, on slavery and human trafficking. We signed a common declaration against uh, this uh, uh, things uh, which affect uh, modern society, the, the whole of humankind. Then we went to Buenos Aires and we held another similar conference, a third one in Istanbul again. And now we are preparing the fourth one uh, in one of the Greek islands uh, to take place next uh, May. Uh, I want to say that through all of these uh, collaborations and actions, we want to sensitize people and to contribute to the improving <laughs> the state <laughs> of the world Excellent. from the spiritual, from a spiritual dimension, um, keeping in mind always that uh, 
there is an interconnection between the way we treat the earth, yes. the sacred earth, yes. I would say, and second, uh, how we relate to people mm. and the way we worship God. Mm. These three things are, are inseparable, Absolutely. inseparable. If, we, as I said earlier, if we say that we love and uh, worship and respect uh, God, uh, this love and respect of ours has the consequences mm. on earth and towards our fellow human mm. uh, beings. So this, we have never to forget this uh, interconnection between the way we treat the earth, uh, the way we relate to our fellow human beings, mm. and uh, the way we worship God. Excellent, thank you. And I think that, that connection of how we treat the earth, um, Cohen, I want to talk to you about um, how companies can divest from fossil fuels. Um, I will say the city of New York, Mayor de Blasio, and the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, um, really have focused on what we're calling climate accountability and divested, um, New York City divested about four and a half billion dollars of our pension funds um, from the major fossil fuel companies. And it's something that from a city perspective and the way that we manage our money, we're able to um, take a leadership role on. I'm curious how um, you're doing that within your field in the private sector and real estate specifically? Well, the great thing is that if you look at a, the, the level of a building, it's relatively easy uh, to do it. We don't, we really don't need fossil fuels anymore to, mm -hmm. to build buildings. And if we do big retrofits, it's easy to take it out. I think currently the real problem is that the incentives for the owners of real estate are not there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you own a couple of buildings in, in your city, in, yeah. in Manhattan, mm -hmm. why would you go through all the effort and do all these things? Especially because most of the buildings are not owned by real companies, they're owned by funds, by all kinds of different mm -hmm. fund structures. Mm -hmm. Larry Fink said something really interesting this morning in a, in a debate. <coughs> he said, by law, I have the obligation to go for profit maximization. That is the American law that tells me if if I, if I set up a, a fund and I have a fiduciary du duty to that fund and to the people that invest their money, my duty is to make profit maximization my target. And in that total picture, even if he really wanted to, it's relatively diff difficult for him to invest extra. And so I think that that is sort of the, the, the negative. Yeah. Uh, I think that at the same time, he also realizes he has to be within the law. And if you know, mm -hmm. municipalities are able to change uh, the way things are being done and if governments change uh, their, uh, their laws, then things become easier. The technology is there. The technology is becoming a lot cheaper and will get more cheaper now that more companies are investing in it. But there will always be a small group of companies that are willing to do it just because they want to be on the forefront mm -hmm. and they want to be on the good side of the equation. But a lot of companies won't do that. The real estate industry is one of the most fragmented industries in the world. Uh, I don't think there's anybody that owns more than 1% of the, of the real estate in Manhattan, probably the city itself, mm -hmm. but no, uh, no private owners. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, it's really difficult uh, for a group of, of uh, entrepreneurs to sit together and to say, okay, let's do this, let's join forces and, and make it happen. It's just too fragmented. Um, and therefore, uh, I don't like to say it. Um, um, I'm a little bit we of a liberal. We have to be positive here. But we have to, <laughs> we have to look at government and we have to find a way yeah. to build a green deal together. Yeah. Let's say let's, let's raise the bar. The leggers have to go out of the market. The, the yeah. innovators have to go. <coughs> uh, but we need the government to step in and, and put the bar higher. Yeah, absolutely. Totally true. I agree with you. <laughs> That's not your prime minister, is it? Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could make, get something done here. <laughs> Um, Ayaka, Nobody can, agrees with me. We all agree with you. <laughs> we all agree with you, and I think you speaking to the 300 million people in your church are, is incredibly powerful. Can I tell uh, an, an interesting story? I Please. was lucky enough to be invited to, uh, to go to, uh, uh, to the Vatican, and I, uh, I met uh, the Pope. And I uh, had a very short uh, conversation with him, and I, I thought I can pitch uh, <laughs> to, uh, to the Pope. And I said, hey, I would love to help you to make the, the Vatican energy neutral. And he said, my son, look up all this light. I changed it. It's LED now. <laughs> oh, that's it fantastic. was one moment of optimism that I had <laughs> where I thought maybe the world can be saved. Amen. Well, and the it's going to be. If, if you allow me to say. <laughs> Please. The Pope is a very uh, human person, very uh, mm. modest, very. Apostolene, uh, tapinos. Humble. 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 
And once I visited him, I, uh, I had been many times in the Vatican as his guest. Uh, once I was leaving the Vatican to go to my car and then to the airport, and I saw that the Pope was coming behind me. Mm. I turned and I said, Your Holiness, please, thank you, goodbye. No, no, I want to accompany you until uh, the last moment, until your car. Uh, I do this, do you know why? Because I know, I, I, I want to be sure that my guest has left. <laughs> and, and, and second, because I want to be sure that he didn't take anything from my <laughs> <laughs> So, Ayaka, um, we have been, you know, the, I think on the action piece of it, what Greta said this morning was, listen, we're being heard, the young people are being heard right now, but we need the companies, the governments at all different levels to take action. Can you share with us some of the action that you're seeing in the community that you are excited about, that you want to drive more attention to, um, to ensure that this is a movement that continues? Um, definitely in that space, I feel like people of color and people that are vulnerable are actually opening their eyes and they're realizing that it's up to us to actually hold our governments accountable. Mm -hmm. I admire the way that they do things because in South Africa, we are a country that's very diverse. We have 11 official languages. So a religion and culture plays a big aspect in our ways of life and the way we live. So we understand how to utilize the environment in a sustainable way. So I'm very happy to see people actually standing up for what they believe in because out of all these problems that we've been facing in South Africa, Africa, people have developed an immense amount of resi resilience. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that could be bad because they, could, they wouldn't even speak up for themselves because they believe that, no, this drought was caused by God. The flood came because God gave it to us. Or um, we're in this era because God has a plan for our future. Mm -hmm. So just trying to convince them that sometimes it's not God. Sometimes it's a way God is showing us that it's time for us to rise up as a nation mm -hmm. and build something that's sustainable for the future generations to come. So I'm very happy to, when I see uh, more people getting interested in what I'm doing, more people wanting to join me, more people asking me, Ayaka, how can we support you? We see you representing us at a global stage. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure that we as South Africa, we as Africa as the continent are backing you at 100%? And that's really making me happy because it's showing me that I'm not alone in this mm -hmm. movement. I love that. And I think this is where the intergenerational support needs to come in. Um, Mayor, I would be curious how you, um, especially you said you've been mayor now for two months, right? So as you think about your, your tenure, um, how are you going to be prioritizing climate change and you know, um, citizen behavior? Um, there is a lot of influence that cities get to have from a policy perspective that changes people's behavior and the way that they, they live daily. And I'm curious, what are the things that you're thinking about in the space of climate change? Well, it's about, uh, like I said earlier, engaging people in in their own city. This is, Riyadh is their city, and they need to own its future. Yeah. And so we can introduce the, the metro, but they have to use it. Yeah. Uh, we can introduce subsidy reform, but we have to you know, allow them to be aware about the importance of insulation mm -hmm. and lead lighting in their, their own homes, mm -hmm. so that they are able to make their own decisions about how to use the, the energy in their homes. But we also need to engage them in the broader um, uh, set of initiatives. So we're investing over $70 billion in sustainability over the next 10 years. Wow. And one of these projects is using gray water to green the city and lower temperatures mm -hmm. by two degrees, which is an important issue uh, for Riyadh. So we're, we're actually uh, planting seven million trees, a tree for each citizen <laughs> in the city of Riyadh. And we hope that each citizen will actually plant their own tree and uh, be able to uh, you know, name it after them and uh, feel that they own the, the city of Riyadh in many ways and its future, and, and it's a green future, I hope. We should do that in New York. Eight and a half million more trees there would be <laughs> a welcome addition. Um, Cohen, I'm, I want to talk about the real estate um, sector and how um, you talked about it a little bit, but the role they can play in climate adaptation and in building urban resilience. What are you seeing that's exciting you in that space? There's a lot of experimenting happening. Uh, we've seen <laughs> projects where uh, people are building floating homes. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think that's the, yeah. the, you know, sort of the maximum that you can do. The houses will flow with the, the, the sea uh, coming up. I don't think it's a real solution uh, to, uh, to anything. Um, I think that um, what is interesting in the Netherlands is we can deal with the sea being <laughs> roughly a meter higher. Mm -hmm. um, we have the technology to build dikes stronger and bigger. The real problem that the Dutch have is that the country is so, uh, so full 
mm. that the rivers going through the, the, the country, um, if, if a lot of rain falls in France and in Germany and that water flows into the Netherlands, we don't have the space to carry all that water and, and yeah. bring it to the sea. Yeah. And you can imagine if the sea level rises, it becomes yeah. more difficult to do that. Uh, building one dike is easy, but the whole delta is very difficult to manage. Mm. And so what they've done now is they are making a new law where you're only allowed to build close to rivers, and this is really kilometers away from rivers, mm. um, if you have the possibility to let the water flow into that whole area. And so the houses are being built on a higher level, and we give space for the river. Mm. Um, New York, um, uh, after the, the hurricane, decided to, uh, to also think about building dikes and mm -hmm. doing things in a certain way. And I think that they are also now contemplating uh, to do it in a way that if really a lot of water mm -hmm. you know, flows in, mm -hmm. that they can allow some of the streets to be filled to with be, water yeah. just to give space to the water. Because if you yeah. fight the water to the yeah. max, your dikes will break one day and it's difficult to, uh, to really manage that. And um, I think trying to not fight it, but work together with it and understanding mm. the, 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 the force of nature that mm. comes towards you uh, yeah. in those uh, situations, that's what is, uh, that is what is necessary. In the Netherlands, uh, at some places we have the space, but also we have big cities at the rivers, mm. and there it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to really do that. And uh, that will cost a lot of money, and uh, the sad thing is if we would have spent that money earlier mm. on the right technology of changing houses, etc., we would have been a lot cheaper off, mm. uh, but that's not happening. So we, um, we have to wrap up, and one thing I want to hear from all of you is um, what you'd like to see in, in terms of change within the next year, right? I mean, we are talking about action now. I mean, Cohen's made it clear that we could have done things a lot better <laughs> previously. Um, whether it's in your industry, whether it's you personally, it's whether it's how you want to influence people here at Davos, what would you like to see change um, in the next year? And whoever wants to go first is welcome to. Happy to do that. Uh, I, you know, for me, it's about all about education, and I would like to start with the youth. Seventy percent of the population of Saudi Arabia and Riyadh is, uh, yep. is under the age of thirty. Wow. How about if we start at the K through twelve level and start teaching um, our students how to be stewards of the uh, of nature and uh, of sustainability? I think this is where I would start, and I would start programs at at uh, at, at first grade, basically. Yeah. Um, just to add on that, um, it's a really great platform that you have provided here because um, in what I'd like to see change is like our government taking more action in, in regards to this. As the African Climate Alliance, we have a couple of demands that we had for our government and one of those demands is having mandatory climate curriculum based education in schools so that every single level of education in South Africa or in Africa at a global um, stage um, knows about climate change and knows how to treat the environment and how better to live sustainably in order for us to actually build a more sustainable future for the generations to come. So I would definitely see those actions put in place and I definitely want to see government um, implementing the policies that, that are great that I already have in place. So it would be really great just to see them, that they know what we're facing and they are with us and that they are willing to actually make sure that the citizens of their country are, are living sustainably. So it would be really great to see more implementation from our government. Excellent. Myself, <coughs> I would like to make an appeal to the world leaders. Many of them are present here in Davos in these days not to put uh, their, the, 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 uh, that of their country's uh, material, financial interest, above uh, the real interest of the humankind mm -hmm. related to the climate change, mm -hmm. uh, COP22. They have to respect the decisions taken in common in favor of the humankind and not in favor of money. Mm. Excellent. For me, um, I see that the, the countries are working to together at the COP uh, and yeah. the, the Paris yeah. Treaty. You see the yeah. cities now working together more and more, yeah. the C40 and other platforms. Yeah. The next step is for businesses to be more united. I yeah. think the World Economic Forum is one of the platforms, yeah. um, but there's also the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Uh, there is uh, the Euro Urban Land Institute. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I will try to do next year is to bring more companies together mm. uh, in different continents and see if we can be a voice with the C40 and with other platforms yeah. uh, to do a green deal on a worldwide level. 
That's excellent. Um, thank you all for joining. I think what has made um, this climate politics is local clear um, is the importance of community activation, whether it's through education or um, religious sermons, but really what it, what it means um, to ensure that consumers, our citizens are aware of what is happening in their communities and have opportunities to act, right? Something that Cohen said that really stood out to me is that we should have done one, two, three, these things uh, much further a few years ago. And I think if consumers were demanding that, that's gonna change. And that's the sort of impact that we're seeing from a policy perspective um, in local government. But thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you.